We brought love to marriage. We brought sex to love. We brought marital happiness as connected to sexual satisfaction. We've made all kinds of new connections. So I still want that, but I also want you to be my best friend. And I want you to be my confidant, the person I can talk to everybody, everything to. And I want you to be my great lover. And I want you to be my intellectual equal. And I want you to be my co-parent. And as we go into millennial and further down, I want you to be the person that helps me become the best version of myself. And therefore, you're no longer just my partner, you're my soulmate. Mm. And that soulmating is the pinnacle of expectations that we bring to modern love, which the, the Jungian analyst Robert Johnson talks about really beautifully. We want ecstasy, transcendence, wholeness, and meaning from our partner, stuff that we used to look for in the realm of the divine. Yo, what's good, everybody? This is Hafiz, and welcome back to another episode and this is another episode i am so excited as you guys can see to bring you this brand new roommate for those who watch the show you know i always talk about my mount rushmore people these are the individuals who have impacted my life the most who whenever i listen to them talk their words shape and transform my worldview. And you know my dad is on there. Um, Jordan, B, B, Jordan B. Peterson's on there. Gary V's on there. And with our channel, as we do a lot of resources to help men, you would assume that, that my Mount Rushmore consists of all men. But that's not the case. There is actually a woman's face carved right in the middle of my Mount Rushmore, and this woman is somebody who the moment I heard her talk with her lovely accent, by the way, the moment I heard her talk, I was inspired. She literally had a way of seeing and understanding the world in a way that I could not even imagine. And I said, whatever I gotta do, I gotta get this woman on the show in four years, and 84 emails later, and I have the privilege to bring to you guys this new roommate. And if you were to call this new roommate one of the most brilliant female minds of the 21st century, I believe that is an extreme insult and an extreme disservice to her because in my personal opinion, she is one of the most brilliant human minds of the 21st century. So without further ado, please welcome to the show one of my favorite human beings of all time, the one and only Esther Perel. Wow. <laughs> can I take this to my mother's grave? <laughs> <laughs> of course. You can take this so wherever you want So she sees how to. others think of me. <laughs> <laughs> no, your mother did a fantastic job, Esther. I'm, I'm, so, I'm so excited for you to be here today. It's a pleasure. It's really a treat. It's really a treat. I was like, oh, what's so he going to ask? What are we going to talk about? Where is he going to take me? <laughs> Listen, there's so many, so many places I, 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 I've been thinking about for years. And, I, and, if, and if I were to ask all my questions, that would take too much of your time. So I'm going to try my best to be as concise as possible. But I mean, your, your wisdom of relationships, of human psychology is just, it's just so remarkable. But so I know who you are, Esther. For those who don't know who you are, can you give a bit of an elevator pitch or synopsis about who you are and what you do? So I'm Esther Perel. I'm a relationship therapist, have worked as a clinician for the past 35 plus years with people from all over the world. Um, particularly, I like to work with pairs, romantic pairs, couples, co-founders, colleagues, co-workers, family members, friends. Um, and I like to see that the essence of my work is about helping people navigate the complexities of modern relationships. And there are many of them. I am from Belgium originally, in case you want to know about my accent. Okay. Um, even though I'm from the Flemish part of Belgium, I am a daughter of two Polish refugees from World War II who came directly from concentration camps to Belgium. 
I am the host of the podcast, Where Should We Begin and How's Work, where I do live couples therapy sessions recorded in my office that you can be a fly on the wall. And I am the creator, the co-creator, I should say, with my team of a new card game called Where Should We Begin? The Game of Stories, where I use play to help us tell the stories that are inside of us and even go a step further in establishing thriving relationships. How's that? Wow. I I, that was amazing. <laughs> that was that was amazing. And Esther, if I'm wrong, please correct me. But how many languages do you speak? I speak nine languages. I work okay, in I knew seven. you were probably got you, uh, any German. Yes, of course. Guten Morgen. Guten Morgen. <laughs> Can we come talk with Deutsch? <laughs> <laughs> so 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 Esther. Uh, before we begin, no pun intended, <laughs> but I'm, I'm very curious what, in your opinion, makes you so good at understanding the complexities of modern or relationships in general? God, I think to think that these are questions that are better answered by people who have been helped by me than by myself. But if I was to think like, you know, what are some characteristics that I bring to my work, I would say, I, that notion that I speak nine languages is what allows me to hear things in translation. It's beyond hearing what people say, is hearing what they mean, is hearing what they hope for, is seeing what the other person or the other people are hearing. And so I can translate, I think, with quite a bit of nimbleness across languages, vocabularies on a personal level, but also culturally religiously, racially, I mean, I, I, I think I've always lived in a very multicultural um, environment and, um, and seen where people actually click and where they don't. And sometimes they don't even realize that they don't. And sometimes they don't and they don't know why. So it's nimbleness. It's uh, thinking out of the box. I think that wherever I see assumptions that masquerade as truths, I tend to kind of challenge that. Um, and there are, uh, let me ask you the same question. What w you who read me or listen to me or feel that I speak to you in various ways, what is it that I do that makes you interested in my thinking and my? What is it that you don't do is a real question. <laughs> but yes, no, it's a um, real question because so, I really so think that other people define us as much as we define ourselves. It's a two-way street. One hundred percent. And so, to me, the reason why I put you on my Mount Rushmore. Um, is that whenever you talk about relationships, as a person, I read a lot of books. Um, I'm not a relationship coach, I'm not a dating coach. I just read books and like to share my opinion. So I read a lot of books. So I, I, I read from a lot of different people. And the way you're able to understand modern relationships to me reminds me of the way I could imagine Picasso looks at art or the way Beethoven looks at music or the way uh, Babe Ruth would look at a baseball, or Michael Jordan would look at a basketball. I think people, it's like God made them with the, whatever he used to make music, he used that to make Beethoven. <laughs> like, and so I think there's something, divi a divine understanding about a, a, an art that certain great human beings like Michael Jordan and Michael Jacksons, who are who are so exceptional in their field, they're able to tap into and they're able to see things in in a way that we can't see. And and I and I originally was introduced to that concept by one of my friends in college because I, I played college football and I had a friend who was a musician, and I was so impressed by him being able to being able to you know do music. And I said, man, I can't understand how you're just able to pick up a guitar and string it. Right. And, he, and he shared to me, he said, the same way I view a guitar is the way you view a football. And the same way you can't imagine how to move your body to make a guitar make music, I can't imagine how to move my body to be successful in football. And so I've realized that some people with just certain skills, they've just, they're able to understand it. Um, the, the minutia of it. And I, and, I, and I believe that's who you are when it comes to um, human relationships. But I do, would, so when you think about football, you know, 
what makes you a very good player is that you have a holistic view. It's that it's not just that you know what you need to do, but that you have eyes in every direction. You're looking at the whole field. You're catching things in advance. You're anticipating. You're not linear. I think it's all of those kind of things that also go into the art of, um, I would say for me, my craft is psychotherapy. It's where I spend my hours really trying to make sense of things. And then, um, and, and then it's my, my, my spontaneity, my, my willingness to take risks, to try things that I, that I never learned anywhere. And just to say, what happens if we did this? I feel like this is what this person should be experiencing or I think would benefit from. How do I bring that person from here to there? And then that how for me is really sometimes quite wacky. I think of things that are absolutely not the straightforward, you know, um, step by step. I'm thinking, I want to take you outside of your con constrictions. And, yeah. you know, it's a lot of my work is about permission giving, uh, honestly. Um, for, uh, and uh, uh, no, some work is about permission giving and some work is about boundary making. I think that some people need to be allowed to open up and some people need to be allowed to become more protective. No, that's powerful. And, and, I, and I love what you said because I think that's what makes um, you so good. I've always said there's, there's three ways of understanding the world. I think the, the first way of understanding it is just from your own anecdotal experiences where you just, you're just able to view the world just from how you can see it. The second way is communal, meaning how do I see, how do my friends see, how do my family see, see it? And then the third way is holistically. How do other people see it? How do other cultures see it? How do other genders see it? How do other people with different backgrounds see it? And so I think it's by me, you, having, you and them. Yes, yes, yes. And so I think that's what you're so amazing at. And that's why you're able to think so outside the box because you're just not limited to whatever cultural standard or expectation or understanding of a situation and the way an artist would have innovation to create great art. I believe your mind has innovation with, with ideas as well. Thank you. That, that I, I receive it wholeheartedly. <laughs> <laughs> so Esther, I want to, I want to, I want to go a little bit back in time because like I said, I'm such a fan of your work, and, and I, and I want to go forward, but for those who don't understand the brilliance, which is Esther Perel, I, I want to go a little backwards before we go forward in this conversation. And so as, a, as an individual who spent a lot of time studying, analyzing, researching, learning about relationships, what would you say were the early relationship expectations of the early 20th century. So during their 20th century, generally speaking, in, uh, and let's just go, most people listening are from the United States, so uh, United States so, um, society. What were the general expectations of a relationship in the early, early 20th century? So expectations, let me put it this way, relationships in the early 20th century were fairly organized around a strict code of conduct that was that was steeped in religion and in communal structures and social hierarchies. So there was a clear hierarchy vertically in terms of generation and who is in charge and who needs to be respected and honored came, you know, older people came first. Um, men came first. Women were the possession of men in many, many ways. Um, legally, it began to switch, but we are still in a very uh, in, a, in an earlier version of the patriarchal structure. Um, so, children are deferential to parents, women are deferential to men, and relationships are basically dictated by duty and obligations. It is not about doing what's right for you. It is certainly not about doing what makes you happy. Happiness is in the heavens, and it, you're going to be rewarded and get some of it if you suffer well on earth. You do the right thing. You don't do the thing that's right for you. <laughs> that is a fundamental difference. That is a collective structure, you know. So a lot of clarity when it comes to relationships, because everybody actually knows what they're supposed to do, but very little freedom. No, no emphasis on individual expression. 
What changes is that we develop over a century and a little more a model where the self and the individual now is in the center. Relationships are steeped in options and free choice, or so we think. Uh, we manipulate it in all kinds of ways, but we like to think that we make our own decisions. We have a lot more freedom. We are a lot more alone. We are a lot more uncertain and we are often crippled with self-doubt because all the big decisions of religions, of religions, of relationships used to be made for us. What you're going to do, who you're going to marry, where you're going to live, <laughs> it was all decided. Um, at the beginning of the 20th century, there is no contraception. And so um, basically we have multi-children family and family means an extended network. Um, it is much more of a practical, pragmatic institution. It isn't meant to be organized around trust and affection and eros. Uh, and the most intimate relationships are not with your partners. They are with your same sex friends. For women, it's powerful friendships with other women. And for men, it's friendships with other men. And we can go on, but this kind of gives us um, a quick synopsis. Okay. And then, so how would you define the expectations for relationships currently in the 21st century? Which ones? Sibling, friendships, work, or love? Let's, let's do love, because I feel like that's where most people um, share that, what they struggle with the most, even though it's all four. People still want, in love, what the institution used to give them. The institution of marriage, which was the sanctioned, you know, arrangement, was companionship, economic support, social status, and family life. I would say people still want that structure, that infrastructure of marriage. But now they want love in marriage. You know, marriage was not about love. If it happened, it was a nice thing. It often happened on the outside, actually. We brought love to marriage. We brought sex to love. We brought marital happiness as connected to sexual satisfaction. We've made all kinds of new connections. So I still want that, but I also want you to be my best friend. And I want you to be my confidant, the person I can talk, tell everybody, everything to. And I want you to be my great lover. And I want you to be my intellectual equal. And I want you to be my co-parent. And as we go into millennial and further down, I want you to be the person that helps me become the best version of myself. And therefore, you're no longer just my partner, you're my soulmate. Mm. And that soulmating is the pinnacle of expectations that we bring to modern love, which the, the Jungian analyst Robert Johnson talks about really beautifully. We want ecstasy, transcendence, wholeness, and meaning from our partners, stuff that we used to look for in the realm of the divine. So the romantic love is the most intense energy system <laughs> at this moment, in, you know, relationally speaking. Everything is packed in to this little group of two that is a, really a tall order. And especially in the United States where that little company of two also needs to be a social welfare system of two. Mm. No, that, that, that is so powerful. And, and to me, when I first heard you share that idea, I was just like, Poosh, you know, like I was, I was, I, I really believe you encapsulated not just the spirit of the past, but also the spirit of the presence because I truly think that we have um, a um, nostalgia of the past, and I see it happen all the time. Yeah, you know, then people will always say, "Well, relationships today weren't like they were back in the day, and we, and we don't have what our grandparents had." And all, and and there's this nostalgia, and the nostalgia to me is is built on a lot of fantasy, Absolutely. because as you share that. In the past, what individuals were looking for was someone to fulfill a duty and obligation. Right. So that's what pe going back to work example, if I was an employer and the person I'm hiring is my spouse, I'm hiring someone to fulfill a duty. So if you're a man, if a woman was hiring a man, she wanted somebody to protect and provide her. Or if a man was marrying a woman, he wants someone to nurture and support. So that's the things that individuals are looking for. And so that's what they got. That's what they aimed at. And that's what they got. And that's what they were OK with. They weren't looking for, as Esther talked about, love and ecstasy and spontaneity and, and mystery and play and all these they things. They may but have looked for it, but elsewhere. 
See, yes. I, there's yes. always been passion. There's always been creativity, spontaneity, but it didn't take place in this one structure. This yes. the fact that you need to be able to contain all of these sometimes f- opposing human needs. You know, the need for stability and the need for spontaneity and and change and innovation and risk and and and, and adventure, they don't necessarily always take place in the same relationship and in, with the same person. You know, the same one has to be your safe harbor, but it also has to be the one who allows you to. <laughs> and it's, it's, I want you to be my safe harbor, but I also want you to be the one with whom I can kind of float, you know, far away into yeah. the, the, you know, mysterious, un, un, undiscovered lands. And it's just, it's a challenge. A few people can do it. You know, Eli Finkel, who's a great researcher of marriage, he says, the marriages of today, the good marriages, the good partnerships, the good relationships of today are often much better than the relationships of the past. But it's just that not that many people can climb Mount Olympus because yes. the view at the top is phenomenal, but the air is also much thinner and not everyone mm. can reach it. Mm. No, I, I remember you shared that on Lewis Howes' podcast and that, that was a fantastic point. And, and to me, I... I, I I wonder if you view it this way. I view it like this. I view it like what what how can I explain this? What human beings want is a bouquet, right? And the bouquet is symbolic to all the things you described. Maybe the red flower, the red rose is. Um, sexual passion, maybe the yellow rose is friendship, maybe the purple rose is spontaneity, you know, maybe the the green, uh, you know, the blue rose is, you know, mystery, right? People want a bouquet, and this bouquet is, is rich with all these different satisfying experiences. But what happens is, like you've said, we want that bouquet from one person. We want one person to provide us all these different roses, where in reality, love it's, and the bouquet is found in all of it. It's found in the work. It's found in the friendship. It's found in the family. It's found in the, it's found in the partners. And there's different things that different people provide you to. But one of the biggest challenges is that, like you've always talked about, by asking one person to provide you with the vast bouquet to satisfy you instead of being appreciative of the rose which which can symbolize whatever they're offering to you causes so many problems with men and women today can i redefine the bouquet a little bit go ahead please i think the, another way for me of of saying what when you say what is it that people really want or need in relationships i I, I mean, there's so many ways to answer that question. There's, there's not really not a one, one and there's not a one size fits all for one. And for two, there are different ways to make emphasis. But today, because I answer that question often quite differently by the day, mm. I, I think the first thing people really want is dignity, a basic sense of respect, um, of being valued, of being sec- recognized, of being seen. Um, and these needs have become more intense in the romantic relationship because, as you say, people often lose their friendships, lose their other affiliations. And so there would become this one person who, if you look at me in the eyes, I know I exist and you're going to relieve me of my fundamental existential aloneness. I mean, this is, I think, problematic. But what people want is a sense of agency and power that I can affect change. I have some sense of control over what goes on in. I want a sense of trust that I can count on you and vice versa, and that we are in this together. And I want a sense of recognition and, um, and, and validation of my integrity, that, that, that who I am matters. And this comes from the work of Howard Markman, and I think it, it, it still stands today as to me. Now, how that expresses itself is different in each one, you know, different ways for people to feel that sense of agency, that sense of value and and that sense of trust. But I would say that that is the trifecta of what people look for in a romantic relationship, in a love relationship, and put it that way. And a love relationship can exist also with a friend, 
you know, and also in the family. It's not just in the romantic sphere. We these days are privileging the romantic relationship as the one and be all. No, no, I, I, and I and I love that, and I and I think that's, um, I think that to me is is a great point because as you shared, you you can find that in many different things, and it's very crippling for one individual to have, to be that, right? To, to create your identity, to create your satisfaction, to give you dignity, to give you, to give you all those things. And so my question to you, Esther, is that if you were to say the biggest expectation difference between women of, the, of today versus women of the 20th century in your personal opinion and from your research and practice, what would you say is the biggest expectation difference between women today and women then? I think it is the freedom, the agency to be able to enter and to leave relationships. Um, there was no exit. Um, until the, you know, I remember as a teenager still when you couldn't go to get um, your money from your bank account without your husband accompanying you. <laughs> it's like, you know, um, whatever I do, I sometimes think about my mother or my grandmother. My mother worked her whole life, but my grandmother also worked her whole life, but a very different kind of work. There were nine children. We were two children. That already redefines it. Um, it's a sense of, of, you know, ownership over, over one's means, over one's resources, uh, uh, over, you know, a, a certain kind of ownership over reproductive health, over our relationships. It is really fundamentally power, um, but in the good sense, not power over, but power to, a generative sense of power that is more direct. It's not that women didn't have power historically. But it always was indirect. It always had to be hidden. It couldn't just be in the public sphere because on top of it, she was relegated to the home. So it's, it's, it's a kind of a flexibility um, together with, their other, with other women and their male counterpart to negotiate the private and the public spheres. You know, you have amazing questions that can't be necessarily be answered one way. It's like I go in a direction, but then I think I could answer this. There's many ways to say what is the big difference of what women want today versus, you know, what they had. I think that a, a sexuality that isn't just a woman's marital duty, where nobody's ever wondered if she wants it, if she likes it, that has now become a sexuality that is rooted in desire, is of course a positive shift because I'm part of a generation that values that positive shift. But it is a shift that has its own complications. I don't think that it is a good past and a bad present or a bad past and a much better present. Things evolve and they always come with a price and they come with new opportunities and new options. No, I, I love that. And, and for those who um, are watching- Certainly episode, don't want to go back, sorry. Of, <laughs> I was just going to say, of course, of I, course. I, I don't want to go back, but I can imagine that some people would appre appreciate something about the stability or the fantasy of stability that existed before and say the present is chaotic and women have it so much, you know, they used to know where they stood. Yes, and where they stood isn't necessarily where they wanted to be. <laughs> mm. <laughs> No, that's true. And so, um, like, like, like I was saying, I, I, I love how you're answering these questions. And for those who this is your first time listening to Esther, you definitely have to read her books and watch all of her videos because she's not going to give, she's giving short answers to complex solutions. So I don't want anybody to think these are the one all be alls because if we were to answer these questions, we would spend days and courses and multiple volumes of books. So I don't want you to feel the pressure of, you know, having to, you know, give all these answers as, you know, to these complex issues. And, and so, no, I think that's good, Esther, because one of the things I'm always interested in is the balance between chaos and order. And, 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 I, and I mean chaos in a yin-yang kind of way. I don't mean it in a negative, like evil, good sound. I don't, I don't believe in that. And so the, the, the past provides a structure of order that people idealize, but the order can be totalitarian, it can be controlling, it can be domineering, 
right? And that's where you don't want to go back to. Nobody wants to go back to any type of totalitarian form of, of leadership. And I feel like a lot of women feel that way. They don't want, like you said, they don't want to go backwards. But, I, but as a response to any totalitarian order, there must be chaos. And chaos is freedom. Chaos is the newness of what can become. And so that's extremely important in society. Life giving, giving birth is, is the chaos, you know? And, and so I see that now there's a, a shift to we don't want that. But what I love that you pointed out was that there, there are new challenges that come from leaving the shackles of order and venturing into the realm of chaos and what's new. And so that's something I've seen when, I mean, I've heard, I, I believe you've probably heard it as, as well, when you've talked to a lot of single women and how when they're navigating the struggles or navigating the issues that they experience with modern relationships. So what are some of the things that you see when, I mean, you mainly deal with, with couples, but when single women um, come up to you and share with you about their frustrations, what are, what are some of the things that you're hearing that's a byproduct of the new world that we're trying to create? So, uh, let me, Afis, uh, many things that I hear from women, I hear from men, and I hear from f people who are queer. So it's, it's not so neatly packaged as, you know, what does woman say and what does man say? I think that there are certain voices in the realm of relationships. Um, romantic agonies are in some way, have a new, you know, have new f facets. If I choose, this is really the work of Eva Ilouz a lot, you know, a wonderful sociologist who looked at, you know, when you used to choose people because of which family they belong to and what kind of land they own and what kind of combinations of the, the lands, then you, if you were rejected, you were not rejected just because of who you are. You were rejected because maybe your family didn't have enough money and maybe it wasn't a good arrangement. But now in the realm of authenticity that we live in, I am chosen at my most authentic but I'm also rejected at my most authentic. And so I think romantic agonies are, you know, are taking an, another layer of, of pain. Um, infidelity is another example of this kind of romantic pain, where the sense of betrayal, the shattering of one's identity, the, the, the shattering of the great ambition of love that I am the one and only and, I, and you are my one and only, that you know, really will destroy a person's sense of self for a while and a sense of reality. I think finding a soulmate on an app is a real challenge. Knowing that, you know, in what women, straight women who are dating men will often talk about is the fact that um, because men don't have to make such an effort in order, you don't have to marry somebody in order to have sex, basically. And you can meet as enough women who will be willing to be with you, then there is a sense that the men are basically not paying enough attention, not making the effort, not investing, and easily ghosting. But I've heard the same thing in all spheres of relationship, with trans people, with queer people. I don't think these things are just gender specific. There is a feeling that relationships have entered the market economy. There's a type of emotional capitalism taking place. And it's about my needs getting met and how long you know, are you satisfying me? And when you no longer satisfy me, maybe I let go of you. It's not about finding a way to live together. It's about my happiness. And if I could be happier somewhere else, I can let go of you. And the receiver of those you know, market strategies, if you want, really experience this in a crushing way because it feels like the human being is commodified in a way that you know I take you I leave you and you know when I take you the feeling is extraordinary much in, more intense than it was in the arranged system but when you leave me it also hurts me a lot more and no, this that, is that, individualism inside relationships basically I think we can. Sh I think we can tweak that. Huh? I don't think this is um, unavoidable. Tweak it to what? We tweak it to a way in which you can be in a free market or you can be in a free choice enterprise and still treat people with respect. 
Yeah. You can still say to somebody, you can say to someone, you know, this is going to stop here or this doesn't work for me or I'm looking for something else and know that it's going to be painful. But at least do the people the courtesy of not treating them like a handkerchief. You know, it, uh, you can be free and respectful. It's not like you're, you, you know, you can be free and, and kind. And, yeah. and understand that you're dealing with people's emotions. So I see broken hearts of all, you know, gender constellations. I don't think that this is a uniquely woman thing. The women have their experience of it more so. It's different if they date women. It's different if it's a queer relationship. But fundamentally, a broken heart is a broken heart. Yeah. It's just that but, the women but, can talk about it more than the men. Yes, and that's a, and that's a point that... I, because I, I was going to transition afterwards to the men, the men point, because this is the part that I feel as though is the biggest thing lacking when we're un, when we're having conversations about relationship, which is why I love your podcast, because you bring in the men to share and then the women to share as well, because I think what happens and women do this and men do it is that we simply hear our parties or our team struggles. If I'm team woman, I hear team woman struggles. If I'm team man, I hear team man struggles. And we simply believe we're the only individual struggling. And what I found as you simply shared is that a lot of the struggles and issues that women deal with are the same exact struggles and issues that men deal with. But at times there may not be as many platforms for men to be able to share, to be able to express their feelings, their emotions. You know, women have the view, they have the real, you know, there's there's a lot of places where women can go and write books and cry Absolutely. and express their emotions. And so what, what a lot of women see is that because there's not as many male platforms or books, the men are not experienced this as well, but this is not the case. And so by being able to understand the humanity in one another, to, by being able to understand that the same exact issues that women are struggling with in regards to connecting are the same exact issues that men are struggling with in regards to connecting. And as a person who, who, who literally has hundreds of thousands of men in my audience and constantly hear men share these stories, I wish we both both genders could hear messages like yours to understand that you're not the only one who is trying to master and navigate dating in the 21st century. Absolutely. You know, I'm, where should we begin? Season five actually is launching today. And it's starting with an episode of two friends, two young men, 25 year olds each, who are both the only South Asians in their town and who develop this deep, intimate, relationship with each other. Of course, the word intimate relationship to two male friends is already unusual. I really think it needs to be called like that. These men love each other. They've been in each other's lives. They are they have other partners. This is a friendship. But you know, they are straight. And so they are un they're not used to talking about it. And they don't want to lose each other. And they want to remain in each other's lives. And it's one of the most beautiful episodes I've done. And I did it because I really think that there's a false assumption about, you know, men. And I, where, when it's like this, in the realm of relationships and in the realm of the emotional life in relationships, if it is silenced for women, it is usually even more silenced for men. If it is, you know, that's it. It's like when it's bad for her, it's mm -hmm. usually even harder for him because he has no space to talk about all of this. And because mm -hmm. the mandate on the outside around masculinity is not one that typically encourages, you know, that kind of expression of, of connection, of feeling. You know, it's like in the male system, you can either be powerful or connected, but you can't be both at the same time, says my friend Terry Real. And I think it's a very important thing. It's like you either are the achiever or you are the related one. And these two young men enact these two parts, you know. One is going completely and thinking. It's, it's an amazing thing. It's the debate be inside of them. It's the debate between the two of them. And it's the tension in our society, culturally speaking, you know, large scale. It, it, I am so glad you're doing this, you know. Um, I, and it's really why I wanted to be with you today too. It's like, w if women keep being overserved and women in that domain of relationship uh, held, and if men are underserved, then the life of neither will be good. Yes. 
and I say women or women identified, it doesn't, it's really, it, it, you can't have one group of people receive all the advice, all the help, all the permission to talk, and then the other group not. Oh, that's, that's beautifully put, Esther. And that's one of the, the things I, I'm, I've been most excited about with our platform, um, because that's exactly what I realized. I realized that people would always have the assumption, because a couple of years ago, I was a videographer on tour um, with um, um, some dating coaches, and it was a it was a women dating coaches, and so that's a lot an of, anthropological field trip. Oh, they, they, I'm telling you, it was, <laughs> and and we traveled all around the country, and I got to hear so many women's stories, different ethnicities, ages, socioeconomic background. So I got a a huge plethora of of just stories upon stories, and 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 I remember one time. Um, a woman raised her hand for a question and she said, you know, I'm looking around in the audience and there's all women. Where are the men who are seeking this information? They send her to the event so she could come back. <laughs> <laughs> or they were too embarrassed and they said, you know, I don't need this. So what kind of a guy goes to get that kind of advice? The guy that know, the guy that's confident knows without having to go to school about it. And of course, that's so not the case. And when you're a therapist in the office for decades, you hear those stories and it's like, you know, <laughs> keep going. I'm interrupting you. No, you're good. Listen. I want to hear you talk. <laughs> so please, but you were going somewhere. You so. <laughs> <laughs> but no, you're right. And and what I shared with her, I said, the men go to the internet because the men are not comfortable being public about what they're feeling. And, and so I said, if a if a woman is sad, a woman, I, I went. To, I was at an airport, and a woman was crying. At, in the airport, and I went to the bathroom, got her some tissues, and she said, thank you so much. She was crying, and people came and consoled her. Uh, men don't feel comfortable in crying in public places, and let alone who's going to come and give him a tissue and rub him on his back and say, hey, hey buddy, everything's going to be okay. So a lot of men are not publicly when they're dealing with issues publicly comfortable with expressing themselves or going before people, like you said, and being vulnerable and saying, I'm not Superman, I'm actually Clark Kent. Here are my struggles, here are my fears, here are my insecurities, here's what I'm dealing with and I need help. There's not a culture of that because as a man and society as well as women project this message where you have to, you must know everything. You must know how to please me. You must know how to converse. You must know how to be charming. You must know how to be confident. You must know this and if you don't know know this biologically just by existing you are lesser than a man so right. i think you know the, the mandate is also very clear you, you know the mandate is be a man show me what you got i mean masculinity is a mandate you, you rarely hear you know be a woman <laughs> it's like women know they are partly because of biology and they don't have to prove it all the time and an identity that you have to prove all the time is an identity that is hard to acquire and easy to lose mm. masculinity is hard to develop and easy to lose and it is a much more fragile kind of identity in that sense and worldwide men get the same messages actually it's not complicated um, and you know, it's interesting, Mating in Captivity, my first book, once it went audio, we know, you know, kind of who, who reads it. And uh, mm -hmm. as long as he didn't have to have the book on the shelf, you know, he could really say he could that, that he read it. And uh, it's a very male friendly book, actually, in terms of the premise, of the way that, my, you know, but it needed a way of doing it without it being known publicly. And then it became a book that men actually could say, you know, I read that book and without being embarrassed about it. It's a very interesting way to track some of the social changes in the past 15 years. And I have to say, watching the readership around mating and then the other stuff, you know, from young men, it's young men, it's the older generation, my generation, boomer generation reflects what you're describing. I think you can see a lot more changes among, you know, 40 and down and it's it I welcome it it's really it's refreshing it's it's a it's a pleasure really it's much more interesting you know to see a, a fluidity of around the norms for both for everybody involved it makes for real interesting social change in the realm of relationship I mean I'm from a generation that 
you know, you didn't see too many dads, you know, with the babies and the whole, you know, the greatest invention, the greatest change for men is fatherhood. It's a very different ways of being fathers than most of the young men today had as fathers. And those are beautiful changes. They also will make men live longer, have less, less health issues, be less isolated. It, it has major other consequences that go beyond just, you know, their relational life. It has to do with their overall physical health and longevity. All these things do require certain qualities of connection that men have been deprived of. They've, they've been given other things, but why shouldn't they have the same range of relational you know, um, permissions than everybody else? I, I agree, Esther. And, and, and Made in Captivity is, is an exceptional book as, as everything that you do. And, and one of the things that, I mean, you have so many co concepts that are so um, worldview changing. And so the first time I heard it, it just blows my mind. And, and the one concept that I think is like your, um, there's this Latin word, but I forget what the word is, but it just means it's like your, your great work. I forgot that Latin word, but it's, I, there's a, the concept is the love story. The Latin word is opus story. magnum. Is that what opus you want to say? Opus magnum. Yes, there you go. <laughs> You're Six smart. years You're of Latin, my dear. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yes, that word, and 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 to me, for you, in my opinion, is the love story versus life story. I think that is the most revolutionary idea that if people can understand it, it will it will literally transform the way they pick partners. And so, for those who are not aware of that concept, can you break down what is the difference between a love story and a life story? You know, it's so funny sometimes how. It's a thing I once threw out, uh, talking actually about myself, and then it becomes a concept. It's the same as erotic intelligence. It first was a thought and then became a concept that I have to define. The idea was this. There were a lot of people that you can, that you can love. You can have beautiful love stories, short stories, novels, you know, chapter stories with people that fundament that that really open your heart that you that you want to embrace that you want to make love to the whole thing but when you think about do i want to live a life with this person can we bring together our two worlds you don't just bring together two bodies or two hearts when you create a partnership for long term whatever long term is you know you bring together values families expectations cultures you can deeply love a person who doesn't really want to be in a monogamous relationship you can deeply love a person who doesn't want to have children or who wants to have children when you don't want to but don't think that you can then make a life together if you have fundamentally different ideas of what you want in life you want a person that wants to travel all the time and you are a person who doesn't want to leave your little town because you really feel rooted there you have a root you know now of course there is an attraction between the traveler and the rooted one between the weeping willow and the oak you know between but can you make a life together do you share enough of the similarity around that and i think that that's fundamentally different that doesn't mean you don't love the person you make a life with but there are many more people that you can love than people that you would make a life with. And they're not necessarily the same. That's all I was trying to say. The person with whom you have the greatest sex is not necessarily the person that you will love the most. The person you will love the most isn't necessarily the person with whom you will actually make a life. And the person with whom you make a life will give you a different kind of love or vice versa. There's not yeah. one love. No. Does that's, that clarify it? How does that no, do? No, you, you, you hit the nail on the head, and, and, there's, and there's three components about that that I, that I love so much. The first, the first component about that was that's a concept I always understood, and I feel as though a lot of people struggle with that because the first myth is that, especially for life together, long-term partnerships, marriage, is that love is enough. And, and what I understood was that Love is not enough if we're both going in two different directions. And so what I, what I would see was I, had a, I would have a friend whose his dream would be, you know what, I want to open a business in New York City. Like I want to open a restaurant in New York City in the meatpacking district of Manhattan. 
and he would be with a partner who her dream was to be a missionary in you know Tanzania or somewhere, right? right? And so what would they would be like, well, we love each other, love is enough, we'll make it happen. But then what happened was one person had to sacrifice their dreams, their happiness, and they end up being miserable in that relationship. And they were like, oh, and then there was issues and conflict and, and challenges. And I realized, I said, you guys have a beautiful love story. There's mutual affection, there's mutual respect. There's, you know, attraction, there's passion, there's, there's beautiful components that create a healthy love story. But in regards to shared values and end destination, those are diametrically op opposed, which we cannot create a healthy life story. And so if more people understood that concept, I believe more people would then not feel as bad when certain relationships didn't work out, especially when their feelings are so strong. Because I think the strong feelings is what makes people believe this is it. So, Afiz, there's two thoughts that come up as you're telling this. It's very interesting. It's very important for people who have that love relationship that cannot necessarily come into fruition to a life story to know that they, they don't have to lose each other. They can stay in a deep connection with each other while they have other partners. That is so unfathomable to people. Why not? You know, these people were important in your life. They were essential people to you. You just didn't want to live the, the same things at this moment. And so you remain connected. And whoever you're going to meet later, you know, is better if they welcome those people and not feel so threatened by them. Because it's very clear that you found someone else with whom you want to be. You don't want to be with the person you were with, but you don't want to not have any relationship. And funnily, so many of the new couples today go are people who through Facebook and the likes go and meet people with whom they had a love story at 17, 18, 19, 20, but then couldn't make a life story because they wanted other things and then find each other again 15 years later. And I have an episode on where should we begin five coming out soon. That's exactly that. They met at 17. They dated, you know, for a year or two. Then there was college, etc. And then, you know, they wanted. And now 15 years later, they find each other again. And that is often the life story catching up with the love story that couldn't at the time be a life story. I have a question for you, Esther, if you don't mind me asking. Yeah. One of the things I could see people saying is that the, the, the fear is that if you're with a person who has such strong feelings with another person, that if that individual is still involved in their life, there may be propensity for that in the, for that your partner to you know commit infidelity because someone whom they have such strong feelings with is still consistently there in their life. What would you say to people who would argue that? I have it's a different thing if it's a story that isn't over. And I really would like to be here, but I couldn't, so now I am here. Then your, your, your fear, your feeling threatened is, of course, so understandable. But if this is really over, it just wasn't meant to be. I loved that person, but we wanted completely different things. And I have a new love. We love more than one people in our lives. And it's, it is threatening to us because this romantic idea really wants us to think that I'm the one and only. Right? You know, we love other family members. We love our children. We love our best friends. We have, you know, if you see that at, from a place not of, you know, they are pining away. They're just with me because I'm the replacement. That's a narrative. You know, I'm not really the one you wanted to be with. The one you really wanted to be with is that person. Then, then you are in an unfinished story. It's a different thing. Mm. Doesn't matter if it's love or life. It's just unfinished. That's like, I really don't feel like you really chose me fully. But I choose you fully now. I had chosen that person fully five years ago. No, I'm not going to go and have an affair with that person. You know, um, and... Affairs exist in the shadow of all relationships, regardless of if you have someone that you once loved or not. That is one of the realities of committed relationships. They, they, there is that fear. And so that fear is very, very normal. We all have it. But the degree to which you say, 
you know, I don't want you to go, I don't want you to stay friends with your exes. I don't want you to have best friends that are not me. And you constantly see it as if you need more than me, then I'm not enough. Mm. That is a challenging reality to live with because you're meant to be a lot. You're not meant to be everything. No, you're not. Mm. Neither are they. Go ahead, Esther. That's it. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) no, I I love that. I love that so much because I think as you talked about, it's that, that that's a byproduct of like you have to have trust. And you have to have trust to communicate whether that story is over. And you gain and when- the trust from having someone reassure you. You by being yes. able to say, you know, that I sometimes think you if you could, you really would have wanted to stay with her or with him or them. You know. But I I, I need to feel that I am fully your choice. And then your job is to say you are. You know, yes, I had a deep, deep, I still am deeply connected to this person, but it is not a threat to us. I don't want to be there. I want to be here with you now. And say it in a way that's not defensive and that's not resentful, but that really says, I get your vulnerability. It's human. It's, we all have it. We all want to feel special, indispensable, Mm -hmm. unique, and irreplaceable. Yes. No, that no, that's that's so good, and 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 another reason why I love the the concept behind life story and love story, and understanding that to have a long term partnership, there there has to be common values, is because one of the things I've noticed, generally speaking, because I deal with a lot of single men, as well as single women, but you no know, majority of men is I've I've noticed that most people have. This is just generalization, obviously, and it's not just limited to this, but most people have four issues I saw happen consistently. Um, Meeting the right person, attracting the right person, evaluating the right person, and then committing to the right person. Those are four general things I saw that young single adults in my age cohort were dealing with. But one of the things I saw so consistently between men and with women um, was that the inability to evaluate people to see whether you can have a life story with that individual. I feel like that's a skill that I was really good at from a very young age, but I feel like a lot of people struggle with that evaluation to be able to differentiate between a love story and a life story. And this is why I absolutely love your card game, because <laughs> what your card game is, is um, where, where should we begin? is that what it allows you to do is allows you to either, you know, reconnect with somebody old and build build deeper relationship or also truly get to know somebody new. I think so much obsession of, of modern love is built upon the novel, novelty of passion and, and, and pleasure, which is which are great things, but there's also this intimacy and honesty and and connection that I feel like is lacked. And I and I love your car game because this is something where by being able to play this with a, a potential partner or someone that you're dating or someone that you're interested in, you can be able to know each other on such a deeper level to really understand if you and that partner could be somebody who could spend that life story together. You know, it's uh, what, the, what playing the game does when you date is that instead of going through a checklist of evaluation, it goes through stories, experiences, mm. things about you would never, you know, you would never know this about me. And by when you tell stories, you reveal your whole world, you reveal your values, your aspirations, your hang ups. It's funny. It's not threatening. It, a game is a container, uh, you know, but in which you can take risks. And then when you play with somebody that you're dating and a few friends at the same time, then you also realize that there are plenty of things you never know about the people you think you know. So I wanted to create a a stress-free, playful, fun, engaging um, experience around dating because I hear so much of the time how dating is not really fun. It's most mostly like a job interview, yes. you know. And I'm going check, check, check. Rather, and plus, you know, it, it's very important sometimes to me. I think that when you think about a date as I'm going to see this person alone, we're going to sit at a table, we're going to ask each other question, drink, lunch, dinner, doesn't matter. It feels so stale. So yeah. an activity is always better. And an activity that involves other people is also better because you get to see this person interact 
with yeah. others. It, you get to see this person in life situations and not on the stage, the theatrical stage of called a date with yeah. all the performative issues that come with that. So I love it when people are writing to us how they took this on a first date, they selected some of the cards and what kind of stories came out. And, you know, rarely do they leave there thinking, oh, that was, but actually, I, will, I won't say rarely. I've yet to hear somebody say this was deadly. It's just yeah. like, man, this was really like, it jumped us. It took us into a, a three steps further because we were able to tell each other all these stories about ourselves. No, it's, 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 it's life changing. I really believe what you created is life changing because as you, as a person who dated for quite a long time, <laughs> I think the two major things was how to ask questions and gain information in a fun way where it's not an interview. You know, I've, I cannot tell you how many second dates I did not get because I'm an interviewer. <laughs> like, and so I think it's something that you did, like as a curious person, that there's not a lot of healthy avenues to be able to create a successful date when it's that interview format, which is why the activity and the fun dynamic of a car game like the one you created is so powerful. And the second thing, man, Esther, I don't, I, I think this is a huge one because I'm going to take a, 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 a a note from the past and bring it to the future. One of the advantages of the past was that you you got to know people collectively, meaning that if you were dating an individual, what would happen was your parents would usually know them, your grandparents, your friends, your sisters, your aunts, your uncles, they'd be somebody in the community. So there'd be a collective understanding of that person. So it wasn't just you gathering information, it was the group gathering information, which created a better um, situation. But what happens today is, so much of dating is in isolation, alone in the You're, park, I alone at agree the with movies, you more. alone at the alone at, at dinner. And so now you're not able to have that collective understanding of an individual because you're just limited to this one-on-one -on -one interaction. So what your game provides, which I love so much, is that you can play this with other people. So you can bring it in a group setting. Maybe, you know, you bring three of her, um, your friends and she brings three of her friends and you guys play this together. And then, then therefore, everyone's Hafiz, better able to understand one another. You should do a podcast episode with the game. Oh, you know what? Invite a bunch of people that you would like to play with and do a whole episode play. Three, I've four never, people. I've never brought my girlfriend on the podcast, but for you, I will bring her on the podcast and I'll play the game with her. That I'll, would I'll bring be some people. So beautiful. For you, for you. Great. You mean the because you mean so much to me. I'll I'll do it for you. I'll bring her on. I'll bring her on the show and I will get some people and I'll play the game. I think I think that'll be great. Mm. Beautiful. On that note. <laughs> <laughs> I thank you so much. So Esther, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate all the wisdom and information and guidance you were able to provide for us. Where can people find you at Esther? www.estherperel.com www.estherperel.com slash blog www.estherperel slash the game. And where should we begin and how is work both podcast anywhere where you listen to podcasts and especially on Spotify. So guys, please reach out to Esther. Um, let her know what about the podcast stood out to you. Esther, thank you so much. Esther I hope Hafiz. you guys are blessed by her wisdom as much as I was blessed with it. My name is Hafiz and I'm joined by Esther Perel. We are the roommates and have a great day.